what you must learn is that these rules or spells are no different than the rules of a computer system. Some of them can be bent, others can be broken. Understand? Then hit me if you can. And now this is where you get into what I think is the really good stuff. I want to talk about how the state uses magic um, to influence us, to control us, the different ways that it's done. It's more than just the use of words. They use the dark arts. I'm going to talk about summoning spirits, possession, alchemy and talismanic money magic voodoo and necromancy so summoning spirits summon means to call to sight or to hint to it's an authoritative call to be at a certain place for a certain purpose It comes from the words sub and moner, meaning under, and to warn or advise. The word conjure means to command on oath, to invoke, to swear together, to conspire, or to bind with an oath. In a magical sense, it means constraining by spell a demon to do one's bidding. The phrase conjure up, meaning uh, to, to, to cause an image to appear in somebody's mind, is from the 1580s. And it actually comes from the Latin conjure, which means to swear together. So to conjure means to command something, to swear together, to, to cause an image to appear in the mind, and to constrain a demon by a spell. This is an extract from a book. Uh, about magic and it's talking about how to uh, conjure spirits it says the best way to exemplify the complicated rituals of the conjuration and summoning spirits is to reproduce excerpts from the medieval grimoires which is a word we looked at earlier this gives detailed instruction on constraining spirits demonic and angelic they also provide information on the ranks sigils or seals and the general characteristics. Okay, so let's have a look at these words sigil. A sigil is an inscribed or painted symbol considered to have magical power. In astrology, it's an occult device which is supposed to have great power. A sigil is a seal, an abbreviated sign or occult stamp, mark or sign comes from the Latin sigillum, meaning sign. And seals are used to signify uh, things of deeper context, more abstract ideas, just like letters and words. And if you look at the diagram, you'll see little sort of squiggles and, and, and drawings. And these are supposed to be the sigils that signify different angelic beings or different things like the sun. A seal is a device or a substance that is used to join two things together so as to prevent them coming apart or to prevent anything passing between them. It's also a piece of wax or lead or other material uh, which has a, de with a design stamped into it and attached to a document to guarantee authenticity. A seal is a thing regarded as confirmation or guarantee of something. A seal is an abbreviated sign or a cult stamp, a mark or a sign. A seal, the verb, means to fasten or close securely, like to bind things together, to seal them up. And then we have examples of some seals here. 
The one on the left is a magical seal uh, known as the double seal of Solomon. And you'll see the name Tetragrammatron written in the points of the star, which is apparently the name of uh, what's the name for God. Um, and this is a magical seal which gives you power to summon sp uh, spirits to do your bidding. Uh, on the right, you have the Great Seal of America. And on the bottom right, you have just an example of the sort of seals that you might see on letters. And kings would have done this sovereigns. Sovereigns would have a sovereign ring, which is their unique mark or, or sigil or sign. And they would emboss a letter or a document with their sovereign ring to signify that it had authenticity and that it came from them. So if we look at this picture in the context of conjuring and uh, magic, um, what we see here is we see some interesting things. We see on the floor some, some markings, and this is a seal. And the demon is also, or the spirit is also standing in a seal. But what's very interesting is that the magician, this is Elvis Levi, who is a 33rd degree uh, Freemason. It's a very well-known uh, picture in occult circles. Um, but how, is he, how does he have the power to make this entity appear before him? He needs a couple of things. He needs a couple of uh, elements to do that. If you notice, he's holding a piece of paper. And as I already pointed out, he's standing in the seal. But in order to summon a spirit or an entity, you need to have its name. If we're in a room full of people and I and I need to talk to you in particular, I need to call you, I need your name if I'm going to shout it out. And the only way I can get in contact with you and get you to respond to me is if I have your name. Here's another example of the previous image. But you'll see a familiar, it, it's a different take on the, on the, uh, on the summoning of the demon, it's actually a grey alien. But on the right hand side you have John D and Ed Kelly who are also performing necromancy, summoning up a, a spirit to do their bidding. And you'll also notice that they are standing in a seal. They have the markings on the ground um, that give them power. They also have a, a book. Ed Kelly actually has a book in his hand. This is what's giving them the power to, to conjure the spirit to do their bidding. So if you look at any sort of, of the Grim Wars, you'll see what you need is um, the sigil or the sign or the seal used to, to call up the spirit and to protect yourself, okay? Uh, so it's basically, a, you, you need to know the correct symbols which have the, the, the power behind them that you need to perform that, that, that uh, ceremony. You need to have the name of the spirit or entity that you want to call upon and you need to have the words which give you authority you need to you need to have have words uh, giving authority to do this so how does this apply to you and how does this apply to the state and what's this got to do with anything well how do you feel when you get one of these through the door a summons to appear at a certain place at a certain time with your name on the document you're a spirit aren't you? you're a spiritual being so this summons which has the magical seal at the top the sigil the seal which has power apparent power the name of the spirit that's being summoned okay and the words of authority um, notifying you to be at a certain time and place time and place is the space-time continuum you're summoned to, to appear as if by magic to be at a certain time uh, to be at a certain place at a certain time to do a certain thing because they have your name They're summoning up spirits to do their bidding. So, an order to pay 
is just words. Think about it. I order you to pay. You respond to that because, well, there's the element of fear involved. But that very element of fear is the effect of the magic upon you. Because really, they're just words. But these words are strategically used in such a way, a tactical way, so that they compel you to perform, they compel you to act. A judge utters a word and it comes to pass. So just imagine the judge is a wizard, okay? He's sitting in his chamber and he writes, I know judges don't write summons, but let's just go with the analogy that this powerful wizard writes the word summon and he writes the magical seal that gives him the authority to do this. He writes the name of the spirit down that he wants to appear. He writes the time and place and he sends that out. He sits in his chamber and he waits and when that time comes to pass then the spirit shall appear before him. It's you. And then what we do is we try to, without even realizing, and this is why this is such important information, because once you have this as a perspective, then you can start to think about how you handle your affairs in a completely different way. Because what we do in response to these demands or spells that are cast upon us are spells themselves in a way. For example, somebody gets a summons through the door, they will probably go to court, some people will go to court and maybe dispute it, uh, or they might get a solicitor. See, solicitors are better at casting these spells. So we hire solicitors to cast the spells for us. But what we're trying to do is minimize the effect of the magic that's been cast over us. When a judge issues an order to pay or perform, or else circumstances will follow, like imprisonment, you know, it has an effect, uh, a supernatural effect, because it's outside the laws of nature. He doesn't have to put his hands on you, but you will be placed in prison because the system of magic, the, the system, the state, the machinery, that word M-A-G-H, the mag, completely empowers him to do this. He's tapping into the magical system of the state. This was a part that I wasn't going to put in. I wasn't sure about including it. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on it because I haven't fleshed it out enough yet. Um, and it's not really a spell that they cast upon you. It's more um, something that we allow ourselves. We allow ourselves to become. We always hear the phrase that possession is nine ten tenths of the law. And fundamentally, law is supposed to protect the life, liberty, and property of the people. And property can be obviously your physical possessions, but you know, we also have properties, characteristics, innate qualities. Um, and when you combine our characteristics with our property, our physical things that we own. This is how we actually define ourselves, both through the characteristic personality qualities and the physical property that we acquire. You know, people define themselves by their interests and their likes and their dislikes and uh, their beliefs, their job, their, their role in society, what they do, um, but also like what they own, their car, their um, computers, their jewelry and their clothes. These are all forms of customization. What are you customizing? You're customizing your soul. You got like, all this um, stuff on the internet as well, like YouTube, MySpace, you got iPad, iPhone, you got your branded Coke bottles, and like it's my profile page, you know? It's this whole have it your way lifestyle where. Uh, your, your possessions actually define you. 
but this all of this just feeds the ego um, and what I mean by ego here is the ability of the human mind to feel separate from everything else it's the ability uh, to have an experience as an individual conscious unit it's what makes the subjective human experience that we each personally have um, a possibility. So without the ego, uh, if you experience total egolessness, you feel at one with everything in the universe, which means that you're, you, you don't feel separate from anything in the universe. You don't know where you begin or the universe ends, sort of thing. So the ego is the ability to feel se sense of separateness, but the sense of separateness is not to reach a true reality and then this feeds into the myth of ownership the idea that you can own things you can't really own anything think, think about it the only thing that you can really really claim ownership over is yourself okay and that which you create and even that which you create you're using minerals and substances that are there before you existed and will be there after you exist so you can't really even claim ownership of that what we can really do is claim the rights from the labors that we've invested in it we have void of use while we're here what I'm getting at here is it's a spiritual concept okay it's about the attachment to material things in Hinduism it's all about getting liberation from illusion they call it moksha from maya and the illusion is the physical materialistic world and what they mean by liberation is to detach yourself from materialistic desires to to break for free from the wheel of karma and this is the same belief that we see in Buddhism the truth is and this is what I want to get out of these couple of slides is that you do not possess these things you do not possess anything they possess you they're your possessions. You allow them to define and you. You allow them to 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 be a part of who what your character is. You know, even as far as saying this is my home. It's it's not you that possesses them. It's them, the objects, that possess you, or rather, your ego self. they possess the sense of who you are as a separate character separate entity because it's how you see yourself what did you do to my car you broke my laptop now I'm sad me 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 I'm 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 you know so I'm talking here about the persona the character who you are to the outside world the you that interacts with others no matter how close you are with a friend or you know a sweetheart or a parent or even like a stranger no one but no one can ever know the real you because that exi exists inside you this is the inner you the part of your consciousness that is the same observer whether you're awake or whether you're dreaming the part of you that inner core of your being that hasn't changed as you grew up throughout the years the forever watcher who sits even deeper 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 than your own mind the constant observer this is you the changeless you that remains the same even though the outer character the personality and even the physical traits as we grow from child to teen to man even though these change on the outside there's an aspect of you on the inside that does not change and this is reality and as soon as we're born this inner spiritual consciousness is cloaked by a flesh and blood bodysuit inside this bodysuit is a mind and a part of that mind or an aspect of it is called the ego 
like the another aspect is called memory. But all the elements of mind, body, and spirit simply combine and enable you to have the experience that you're having right now called life. The very physical, emotional, psychological, sentient, and spiritual experience that we are each sharing, um, but as very separate individual units, each having our own subjective experience, our own personal interpretation, our own private narrative unique to each of us. And this is the crazy thing that we call life. So at the point when you're born, at the first point you're born, and you breathe in that first breath of life for the first time, that spark and that moment, you are sovereign. This is true, okay? But we cannot ignore that at that moment, we are also hopelessly dependent on others for our survival. We haven't got the capacity to exercise and practice our sovereignty because as babies and infants, we are incompetent to do so. So this is an inescapable fact, which is often overlooked when you hear people speak of sovereignty. We are absolutely free, yet we are absolutely dependent when we are born, and that's even true to this day as, as we grow. And perhaps this state, our natural state when we are born is nothing more than a reminder of, you know, like our feebleness and mortality. And maybe it signifies on a deeper aspect a social need in man. The need and desire to connect with others and form these bonds and communities and, and so on. So where, where I'm going with this is the idea of possession and ego and that, you know, at the moment when we're born, we are completely sovereign and free. But then as we grow and we develop our likes and our dislikes, our hobbies, and we're influenced by our upbringing, our environment, and our individual innate personalities, uh, we develop a sense of self or who we are and what we do. And, uh, you know, Some people are into different sports and some people might like jazz and while other people might like classical music. And you might support Ireland in football and wear the, color, wear the jerseys and you know, sing the songs and the Frenchman for similar reasons will support France because he identifies himself as being France uh, French. These are all borrowed concepts that we that we adopt into ourselves and we use them to shape our sense of identity in the world, our, our sense of self. These concepts existed fully formed before we were born and we just adopt them. We do not own them. They own us, they possess us because they become a part of our very being. So you don't own your possessions, they own you, or should I say, they possess you. They're your possessions. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Um, there's also this idea of, you know, the registered owner the land owner, the owner of the vehicle and how like the state seem to want you to 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 claim ownership over your materialistic things. But there's a huge difference between claiming a a a right of ownership and a right of use. Or for example claiming the right to own land or claiming land rather than claiming a duty to stand upon and look after and be a custodian of the land. A huge amount of difference and it's a, it's, it's a mental difference. It's the way we look at things. Alchemy and talismans. This is all about making something out of nothing. So alchemy is a philosophy and it's, a, it's an ancient practice that focused on the attempt to change base metals into gold. Um, in a nutshell, it's really trying to turn something of lesser value into something of greater value using sort of magical and chemi chemical practices. Uh, alchemists are different from chemists because they believe in the spiritual ether or the universal fluid and that they have a power to transmute metals uh, from one substance to another. Um, it doesn't have to apply to metals. It's just you know transmuting the substance, uh, f transmuting substances from one to another. And we also have 
uh, talismans. They're objects which are inscribed, like rings or stones, um, that are thought to have magic powers and bring good luck. Um, they're objects created, uh, consecrated by magic. So basically, a talisman is when you take uh, an object that is just a piece of metal or a piece of stone or ring or you know pretty inanimate object and it is consecrated blessed something is done to that object to in order to make it uh, to charge it up with some sort of energy and some sort of power uh, consecrated by magic so the blessing and consecration of a talisman actually takes it from the substance of what it is the stone and charges it into this spiritual object um, it comes from the Greek word telesma, meaning to perform a rite uh, and complete. And it also has a, a root in the word um, telos, which means tax. Bear that in mind as we proceed. This is a talisman called a toller. As you can see, the symbol on the toller is a snake wrapped around a stick. Uh, it's also the symbol for a dollar bill. Because basically what they're doing here is the exact same thing, what, we're, what we see today with our modern money. It's just talismans. It's talismanic magic. It's alchemy. It's taking something of less value, for example, money, and turning it into something, uh, oh, excuse me, paper, and turning it into something with a perceived greater value. For example, you could have a couple of hundred euro uh, in paper, and if I have loads of gold, you will give me that paper in exchange for that gold. Uh, you know, it, 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 but the paper is still still paper. It's meaningless. But the reason why it has value and it's charged is because it's been blessed and consecrated in the temples by the grammarians, by the magicians, by the high priests of commerce. This is talismanic ma magic, and we carry these uh, little tokens around with us, believe in them to have power, and we actually give over our life energy in exchange for these uh, magical scraps of paper. The power of voodoo, the government, a thorn in your side. Voodoo is a polytheistic religion that's practiced chiefly by West Indians, deriving principally from African cult worship and containing elements borrowed from the Catholic religion, which might be a surprise to some and probably isn't a surprise to others. Um, in my recent research, it's been suggested that what we think of today of, of voodoo is actually a mixture of African earth religions and the black magic religion of um, black magic practices uh, that were performed by the elites of Europe who would have obviously being the ones who took slaves from Africa over to, to work in the, the, uh, America in the New World. And when they seen how powerful their masters were, they decided to uh, introduce elements of that worship into their own religion. Usually when we think of voodoo, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously the voodoo doll. Even though it's a, it's a much deeper um, practice than just voodoo dolls. Brief explanation of how a voodoo doll works is a lot to do with intention, and um, actually, most magic is, um, but how to use that intention in the right way, how to, to how to convert your int your intention into actual practical results. In voodoo, it's ideal if you if the object that you're, you're um, the figure of your target resembles your target, but it's not necessary. If you're making an object out of clay or out of, I think that's cling film or something in that picture, um, you would be thinking about the, the, your target. Now, contrary to what people might think, voodoo magic, this sort of voodoo doll magic with the pins is, is mostly used for, for healing in uh, Caribbean cultures and African cultures. They wouldn't use a voodoo doll for, for inflicting harm, usually, although it can't be done. Um, as I said, it's the intended purpose. The colors are significant in all magic because they all resonate at different frequencies, but uh, mostly to do with intention, you know. Um, 
if you pick up one of those pins and I've I've have an intended your target making that or you're making this figurine and you, you, you think about your target, you pick up one of those pins and you think of the intention. It's meditated upon, it's felt, and in a sense it's sort of channeled into the pin. And if if you want to give this more definition, the practitioner might say the words out loud of the intention. Or even more definition, they could write a, a spell in the form of a poem which would add further energy by actually channeling the intent. So each pin can have a different intended meaning and therefore a different effect on the subject. What's this got to do with you? Well, the bird cert is very much like a voodoo doll. It's an inanimate object that's created with the intention of you and it's supposed to signify you and symbolize you in some way. It's a record of you. Some people also refer to the bird cert or rather the legal person that it creates as a straw man, funnily enough. Voodoo dolls are often made out of straw or the corn husks, the straw of corn husks. And your birth cert is the foundation document for your relationship with the state. The birth cert is the foundation document for your bond with the state, your bondage. And you see the magical symbol at the top, the seal. The seal. Seal means to bind together. So the birth cert is your bond with the state. You're supposed to have a mother's bond with a child. But this is the bond that we have with the, with the machine, with the magical system. This is how we tap into the magical system. So the person, or the, the bird search, and the person that it represents is a straw man or a voodoo doll. And basically when they want to affect the human being, the flesh and blood man that the voodoo doll represents, they create spells. And these spells which are laws, legislation, are different intentions. Each one has a different intended purpose. And they are directed, like the pins in the voodoo doll, at the birth cert, at the legal person. So if they want to have an effect on you, all they need to do is create a spell and direct it at your voodoo doll. Can't you see how this magic actually works? Necromancy and raising the dead. Necromancy means divination with the dead, especially to predict the future. And really, it relates to sort of any magic to do with the dead, whether it's like uh, reanimated corpses and getting um, communicating with the dead, anything like that is it will class as necromancy. And um, we think of reanimated corpses. Obviously, we think of Zombies. A zombie means an, a reanimated corpse. Corpse. So we need to think about the word corpse. The word corpse is a noun meaning a dead body, especially of a human being rather than an animal. It's from the Latin meaning corpus, uh, corpus meaning body. You've got examples like corporal punishment and so on. And, you know, it's very important for us to distinguish between a dead and lifeless body and a living, soul-filled body. The difference is that one has a pulse of energy. One has a spirit. One has a soul. You know, how do we check if someone's alive or dead? We check if they have a pulse. We check if there's a current, a charge, a, a, a pulse of electricity running through their veins. The word incorporation is the act of uniting several persons 
into one fiction called a corporation, which is a, comes from the words body or corpse, in order that they may no longer be responsible for their actions. A corporation are, is persons united in a body for some purpose, from Latin corpore, meaning to embody. So, I think you see where I'm going with this. Corporations are corpses. The corporate world is the world of the living dead. This is the zombie apocalypse. Corporations are, you know, destroying the planet. No conscience, no soul, remorseless, straining up the resources, profit at all cost. The profit is like the brains, you know. Brains, brains, money, money, money. They just go around buying up land, polluting, monopolizing, exploiting the whole planet. And it's actually our human energy that is combined and mobilized, incorporated to raise these dead bodies and give them life. And how do you do it? How do you do anything in the corporate world? You need to write it down. It's done with words, spells, power, energy. It's all done through the power of words. And the CEOs, the masters of the corporations, you know, um, they hide behind this corporate veil, which is an actual legal term. And they use these zombies, the risen dead, to go out and perform these nasty deeds. Now it is done using words, but there's a slightly, there's an extra aspect that's needed. Words are the elements that define and characterize and give, you know, substance to the entity that's being summoned. You know, a group of human beings can get together and put their minds together and form an agreement. And once we form this agreement, what we might do is we might write it down. What you're looking at on the left there actually is the Treaty of Rome, the signing of the Treaty of Rome, which is which, uh, an agreement that created an entity, a corporation, a zombie, known as the European Economic Community. And this zombie has been taken has taken on many forms over the years as they've created new spells and recharacterized and redefined the entity. And it later came to be known as the European Union. But the European Union itself is nothing more than a husk. It's an empty idea, it's just a mere concept. It's not a reality except in the minds of those who believe the spell. Why? Because it's artificial. It's man-made. It's not, it's not natural. It's supernatural. It's a corporate construct. And what they're doing here is they are directing their energies to conform the external world to their collective inner will. But the, it's nothing more than a corpse. And they sign these pieces of paper. They give them life. So can you see how the things, all the things that I've been discussing here tonight are used against you in a much more sinister way than you might have previously imagined? This is all being used just to deceive us into believing in an illusion which is nothing more than a parody and a bad imitation of life. It's the world in someone else's image. It's not natural. But words in the context of giving life to these corporate corpse dead entities is not enough. They need a pulse. They need a heartbeat. 
it's the pulse that signifies the life that runs through our body and that's what our signature is it signifies that a living man with life and soul has put their energy and their consideration behind the document that's being signed the signature is like an act of creation it's the logos it's the word using our will and our energy to create a mark that signifies that yes life is behind this and then when we sign that document and we hear the first beep as we give it life Frankenstein's monster lives the logos of God the creator the word the word is the breath of life and we breathe it into this substance and we give life to these entities we give life to many things because we are creatures of creation And what we do with these powers to create, when we understand that words create reality and that the syntactical nature of reality is that the world is made of words, then we, be we can begin to do amazing things in our own lives. We need to remember that magic is the act of conforming the external world to your inner will. It's a technical art which relates to a machine, the proper organization and the tactical use of language. It's about directing energies. Just think about this definition for a moment. Magic is the act or the art or the technique for conforming or changing the external world to your inner will. Magic is a dream come true. A prayer answered, a hope realized. Magic is also a newborn baby, the petals of a rose, a Beethoven symphony. Magic is many things, but above all, magic is an act of creation. And for the second time, I finally made it to the end of the presentation. Hopefully, I hope you got the second half of it. And um, I really genuinely hope that you, you, you got something out of this and that your perspective has changed and perhaps you'll never look at the system in the same way again and if that is true well surely isn't that the very example of what I've been talking about all night and magic and how words are used to influence and change ideologies realities paradigms this, this is a condensed version of stuff I've been looking into, and just you know, uh, you know, a collation of different ideas that I've been interested in for a very long time. There's more I can go into, and I would love to go into at some other stage. I'd love to go into the history of magic itself and the different groups and organizations, societies that use, uh, you know, the secret societies and things like that. But I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this presentation and I thank you for coming on the journey with me and you know bearing with me through the technical difficulties. I'm again very sorry and thank you again for your time. Um, I'm going to go on to the site now and I'll be happy to answer any questions that people might have and are just joining the discussion. If people want to come on and have a chat, you can just add tiernasir at gmail.com on Google Hangout and we'll just have a chat about it. Okay, thank you very much. Iowa.